few departments. That's our webinar. <laughs> Um, the Counseling and Psychology program is a joint program across two departments, the Department of Counseling, Higher Education, and Special Education, which is housed in the College of Education, and the Department of Psychology, which is housed in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. I want to thank each of these departments and colleges for co-sponsoring this event today. I'm excited to have you all here joining us for this very important and timely public lecture by the one and only Dr. Janet Helms. Dr. Janet Helms is Professor Emeritus from Boston College. She previously held the prestigious position of Augustus Long Professor in the Department of Counseling, Developmental, and Educational Psychology. She also served as the founding director of the Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race, Race and Culture. Dr. Helms is an esteemed social scientist, professor, psychologist, and trailblazer who has made invaluable contributions to the field of psychology and society at large. Her groundbreaking contributions have, have encompassed a wide range of areas, including racial identity theories, racially conscious practice, and the examination of racial biases in testing and measurement. Also, Dr. Helms was previously on the faculty here in the Counseling Psychology program from 1981 to 1999. So we're very happy to have her back here on campus joining us to honor, for us to honor her this morning. This event is a part of the Justice and Joy Public Lecture Series, which is one of Dr. Helen Neville's presidential initiatives as current president of the Society of Counseling Psychology. The purpose of this event is to highlight aspects of justice within the larger focus of um, healing, justice and joy, transforming healing praxis. For those of you joining via our webinar online and want continuing education credits, I just have a brief announcement. You must attend the entire session on your computer, laptop, or tablet. Uh, smartphones are not eligible because we have to track the time that you're in the webinar. And you will receive an email from the SCP uh, CE chair with a link to the evaluation survey and certificate after this event. For both folks who might be trying to get CEs in person, we had you could sign up outside for that as well. So just a brief overview. So we're gonna do some intro remarks. I'm gonna have um, in a minute after I introduce Dr. Neville, I'll then have Dr. Neville come up to introduce Dr. Helms. Then we'll have Dr. Helms's keynote talk. Um, then we, there will be a conversation with Dr. Neville um, and Dr. Helms. And then also we'll take questions from the audience, both here in person and also on Zoom. And then have some closing remarks with folks we have representing the College of Education and the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. And then we have an evening reception to honor Dr. Helms. All right. So since Dr. Neville is going to formally introduce Dr. Helms, I just wanted to tell a quick story. Um, that highlights Dr. Helms's impact on me and many others. So like many of you, I was introduced to Dr. Helms's work when I was taking a multi multicultural counseling psychology course in my master's program. And I remember reading about Dr. Helms's racial identity theory and her research and the role of race in counseling settings. And I was just in awe of her brilliant scholarship and her development of the racial identity attitude scale. And I was really interested in studying students of color and their impact um, and the impact of race-related stress and how they utilize racial identity as a form of coping. And so I came across her people of color racial identity attitude scale and used that for my work. So, um, you know, that burgeoning interest very early on blossomed into attending the diversity challenge, my very first time. and. Um, in true Dr. Helms fashion, kind of taking me under her wing when she knew I was a first time attendee um, and getting lots of mentorship and support over the years. And also, um, I owe a lot to Dr. Helms because as I was doing research on my thesis way back when, that's how I got exposed to Dr. Neville's work and then ended up working under the mentorship of Dr. Neville at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So Dr. Helms has mentored so many people over the years in our field and particularly as a black woman psychologist, I just really appreciate all of the mentorship and support that you have guided all of these people. Um, so without further ado, I just wanna now introduce Dr. Neville. She said short bio, Dr. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I'm going to be brief. So Dr. Neville is currently a professor of counseling psychology and African-American studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She is past president of the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity, and Race. She has co-edited eight books, nearly 90 articles, and most of her work is on race, racism, and racial identity. She also is a recipient of the Janet E. Helms Mentoring Award from Columbia Teachers College. And um, lately, Dr. Helms is doing a lot of work on healing and really thinking about folks of the global majority and how they are healing from racial trauma. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Helen Neville. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I so appreciate you. Um, all right, it's great to see so many faces here and so many people in the room. I'd like to thank the College of Education and the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences and the other units at the University of Maryland College Park for hosting this public lecture. I would also like to give a big special thank you and shout out to Dr. Gioni Lewis and Dr. William Liu for making this possible and all your hard work. Yes, give them an applause, absolutely. I know that when um, I asked, you know, is this possible for you all to host an event? They said yes, and they made it happen. So I am really appreciative of that. Um, it is an incredible, distinct honor to introduce Dr. Janet E. Helms, which I like to call the GOAT, the greatest of all times. Not like I knew that word, but my, my, uh, some of the students introduced me to that word, and I think that definitely applies to Dr. Helms. I can think of no one more exciting to provide this and, and um, position to provide this public lecture on the theme of justice as it relates to healing. There are many dimensions of justice issues in society that impact our personal and collective well-being, with racial justice being one of them. More than anyone else, Dr. Helms has transformed the field of counseling psychology, and I would argue psychology more generally, to tackle racial justice through her research, leadership, and mentorship. Um, so just let's talk a little bit about each of those areas. Dr. Helms' research changed how we think about racial identity and their roles in healing relationships and creating anti-racist spaces, which is really important for racial justice. Her outstanding research career really focuses, I know folks have talked about identity, but what I love about what she does is she focuses those, let's put a spotlight on the issues that people don't want to talk about, naming racial processes like whiteness, is. Uh, white identity and anti-black racism before they were even popular to talk about when they would have symposiums at APA to denounce her research she would stand up with conviction and really just help model what it's like to move in this world as an ethical person she is co uh, uh, yes give she deserves a round of applause for that yes she has authored and co-authored over 100 empirical and theoretical articles and books on topics of racial identity and cultural influences on assessment and counseling practices, an area we can't even get to because we'd be here all day. Um, but her books include A Race is a Nice Thing to Have, and it's in its third edition, so feel free to, to get that if you don't have it already. And with Donnell de Cook, she has Using Race and Culture in Counseling Psychotherapy, Theory and Practice. Not surprising, she has received uh, so many lifetime awards, including from APA Division 17 and 45, as well as APA APF Gold Medal Award for Life Achievement in the Public Interest. Um, and she's even got an award created in her honor from APA Division 17 that focuses on racial justice. Dr. Helms has ushered racial justice also in terms of her leadership. As Dr. Lewis said, she's the founding director of the Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture at Boston College. She founded their diversity challenge and ushered that in for over 20 years, again, before people were even thinking about talking about these issues. She is, um, as past president of the Society of Counseling Psychology, she also focused on dismantling racism, highlighting racism, providing tools for people, um, especially college students. 
through her mentoring, she also um, focuses on racial justice through the ways in which she brings in students who are diverse and, and socializes them to tackle and actively dismantle racism, to name it. Um, I know this because my mentor, Dr. Shalmar Thompson, was mentored by Dr. Helms, and I benefited from her advocacy and willingness to uh, go to bat for me when I acted out of control. So I really appreciate that. I'm sure she got that from you. Um, she received lifetime mentoring awards and has been um, and has a mentoring award in her honor um, from Teachers College. I feel like I am just scratching the surface, but I really want to turn the stage over to Dr. Helms so we can learn from her brilliance. So uh, Dr. Helms, please come to the podium. Thank you. How does it work? Okay, we'll see what happens. <laughs> My goodness, those were such great introductions. I hope I can live up to them. Um, this is the last day of Black History Month. Um, I still don't know why we have the shortest month of the year, but the, I chose the 29th for my presentation because I want to talk about issues that are disappeared in, in, our, in our lives, even though they have great influence over who we are as people, uh, whether we are black people, other people of color, or white people. But we don't actually talk about these issues in an honest way. And so I have developed a model, which I call the WIMP Lash Model which hopefully I will present to you in a way that you can begin to understand how it is that we've all been played for dupes in our society and how we need to begin to change ourselves so change ourselves so that we can change the people who actually have the power over us in this society. These are the objections, the objectives of my presentation. You may object too, but these are the objectives. <laughs> I want to use race history to explain uh, present day racial dynamics. I want to describe my model of white heterosexual male privilege, WHMP, which I pronounce WIMP. I want to, <laughs> I want to make visible the WIMP lash protective strategies and want to illustrate how whiplash was used in the Supreme Court's affirmative action decision. And then I'll help us to think about how we can redefine woke for white people so that they don't go around acting so ignorant in the world. Now, I always want to do more things than I actually have time to do. So I don't know if I'll get to all of these things, but if I don't, you'll know I had good intentions. <laughs> So let's have a thought moment. Close your eyes for a couple of minutes. Maybe not that long. And tell me and visualize who you see when I make the following statement. We, the people of the United States. If you have an image, raise your hand. OK. Uh, I'm not going to ask you what your image was, but let me just do a quick check. Did anybody see uh, people who were women? If you did, raise your hand. Did anyone see people who were, uh, who looked like you? Okay, chances are whoever you imaged, that is not who the Constitution meant were the people of the United States, okay? The Constitution was written by heterosexual 
white heterosexual males with power and privilege. And privilege for them meant property or the society's resources. So the only definition we have of who the people are are the definitions that were provided by that group. And naturally, they define the people in terms that define themselves because, after all, they were writing this document. If the lion writes the document, then the lion describes him or herself. So the only definition we have of who the types of people are in the United States are in uh, Article One of the Constitution. Uh, actually, where is my Constitution? Oh, here is my Constitution. Don't leave home without your Constitution. <laughs> and the, that definition actually defines us all as property. And so it, be, it begins to talk about the types of people. It actually lists these uh, essentially four types. Uh, free people or free persons. Now, who could those be? Well, you might think that free persons were, were meant white people, but that, that can't be the case because there were, uh, by the time the Civil War came around, there were like 200,000 people uh, of African descent who were called free people. There were Native Americans who were called free people. So who did the Constitution actually mean by free people? Well, the only people who were really free were white heterosexual males with power and privilege. But in order to uh, decide how much taxes to pay and how many representatives there should be in Congress, they decided to count all of the other people who were labeled free people, even though they weren't really free people. So then there might be persons who were bound to service for a number of years um, uh, too. They were fully counted, the, in, the quote unquote indentured servants. Now in my um, history classes, which were limited on this topic, but the one day we talked about slavery, uh, indentured people were supposed to be white people who came over with a contract. They had tea uh, delivered to them when they got here. Uh, they, uh, they served a limited number of years and then they were free to go off and be free persons. Well, actually there were indentured uh, people of African descent too, and they had contracts uh, and they uh, served for a number of years and then they were free people too. So I guess they were counted as, as, as uh, fully counted when it came to deciding who were representatives. Then there were quote unquote Indians now the constitution is badly written and it's clearly an example of why we need the edi initiatives because if they had included uh, people who look like all of us in in the writing of it we wouldn't have written such a faulty document but anyway it says that indians weren't counted but it also says that maybe they could be counted if they paid taxes and so we don't really know whether indians were property too or whether they were only property if they paid taxes. Very confusing. So that leaves us with the question, who are, who are the other persons who are the last category they, they denote? And this is the category that uh, counts for only three fifths of the members of this, this uh, category are counted in terms of taxation and representation. Now there's a whole lot of myths about who the other persons are. Uh, for example, I frequently hear during Black History Month that the three-fifths uh, uh, statement means that Black men were three-fifths of persons. Well, the Constitution does not say that Black men were three-fifths of persons. Uh, well, then who are these people? Uh, the truth is, we don't know who these people were. If they didn't fit in any of the other categories, what categories are left? So being a kind and considerate people, the framers of the Constitution didn't want us to live without knowing who the other persons were. So they met together and decided who the other persons were. And they decided that the other persons were slave people or enslaved people. Now, most of us were taught that all of the enslaved people were people of African descent. 
But in fact, in the history of the United States, there were uh, African uh, descent people who were enslaved. There were white people who were enslaved. There were native people who were enslaved. By the time the Civil War started, the largest number of enslaved people were black people. But actually, the model for slavery came from the enslavement of white people in the colonies and in the United States. And how do we know this? Because it doesn't show up in the history books. Uh, you have to search for history books to talk about white slavery. Part of the way we know that is that it's, it's hidden in our language. Slavery is actually a, a European term. It's derived from uh, people who spoke Sl Slavic languages in Eastern Europe. They were enslaved uh, at least for a, a century. And so when uh, slavery was imported to the United States, the slavers used that language because they were familiar with it. Uh, you can find that the definition in a, a Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Kidnappers. Uh, in Britain, when they when the royal class, the upper class, wanted to clear the streets, what they would do is they would hire slavers to steal children from the streets. The slavers would steal the white children from the streets, and they would ship them to the colonies and to what became the United States, where they were enslaved. And so there are stories of child uh, uh, labor laws, where, or the lack of child labor laws, where children were worked uh, 70 hours a week or so 70 hours a week or so every week. They would, and uh, the kidnappers would also be uh, people who took the poor white people off the streets in Britain. They shipped them to the United States and they were enslaved. They were slaves. And so we know that there was slavery. Some historians say that the slavery of white people was the model for how they enslaved uh, us, how they enslaved African American people. They also say that the uh, models that they were used to round up slaves to ship to the United States and other colonies were the models they used for relocating the Native American populations in our country. Uh, remnants of the language, backlash, whiplash. What do you think about when you, when you hear those terms? The dictionary gives, uh, Webster's dictionary gives a uh, Interesting definitions. Uh, backlash, a strong adverse reaction uh, as to a recent political or social development. Hmm. Whiplash, the lash of a whip. Who defines the word by using the words in the definition? <laughs> well, my uh, associate, Miriam uh, Jernigan Noese, said to me one day, well, when I do a presentation and people talk about backlash and whiplash, that has a different meaning to me than it does to them. I think about backlash, the, the uh, scars on the backs that I see in pictures of former enslaved black people. Whiplash, I think about uh, uh, movies of enslaved people where the white uh, uh, slave owner is whipping people with a whip uh, in order to control them. And so she said, I think instead, instead of using the word backlash or whiplash, we, sh we should use the word wimp lash to mean white heterosexual men of power using their weapons of power to control other people and to maintain their power. So when I use wimp lash, you'll know that's what I mean. White slavery is also implied in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't actually have subtitles for its am amendments. And so the, uh, civil, the ACLU version of the Constitution helpfully gives us an idea of what they think the amendments mean. So the 13th Amendment, people commonly think of as the abolition of slavery. And when they say abolition of slavery, they mean abolition of black slavery. Well, the 13th Amendment doesn't actually mention black slavery. And so I suppose we could, we could assume that uh, the sta statement, well, I'll read it, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a, punish a punishment for crime, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera 
shall exist within the United States or any place subject to its jurisdiction. Now, that, that sounds a bit redundant. If, if we believe, if we accept that all of the slaves at that time were black, then what does involuntary servitude mean? Who was, who was possibly engaged in involuntary servitude? Well, involuntary servitude, Webster says, is the condition of being forced to work against one's uh, will. It includes slavery, but it's broader. Well, what does that mean? What's broader? If we go, we go down to the 15th Amendment, which is labeled black suffrage. It didn't really give black people the right to vote. But what it does is it gives, uh, it's, again, uses the term previous conditions of servitude. Um, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied uh, or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Well, servitude without being involuntary is a condition in which one lacks liberty. So how is that different from being enslaved, a person uh, held in servitude as chattel of another? In effect, the, uh, if we think that they're talking about the same people, then this is really badly written because it's redundant. What they were doing in effect, however, was, also, was freeing the uh, white men who were poor and who were working under conditions of involuntary servitude uh, during the South. Now, interestingly, the poor white men who, who fought in the uh, Civil War they knew that they were fighting to uh, free the black enslaved people. They weren't admitting that they were fight, fighting to uh, free themselves as well. They didn't want to fight because the slaveholders, according to historians, had convinced them that they were treated, well, the historians actually were conflicted. Some of them say that uh, Black slaves were treated better than white slaves. Others say that uh, white slaves were treated better than black slaves. I, I say that however they were treated, all of them were in horrible conditions. But what that means is that the different groups of enslaved people were pitted against each other. And so whether they were treated better or worse, they thought that their circumstance was worse than the others. And so that began, began a cycle in which there could not be unity among poor black people and poor white people because the uh, conditions, the, the political structure would not allow that to happen. And we can see that that's course through our history that the uh, uh, powerful structure does not want the poverty the, the, uh, the non-wimps to have influence in the system. So following the Civil War, we began to see the beginning of the birth of white supremacy. Now, white supremacy does not mean that white people are, are superior or that they're smarter or that they're brighter. What it means is that they've been given the rank in our society to control other people. And they were given that rank by the power structure, the whip structure. So that was a gift. And it, as a part of that gift, they said, well, we have to do something to differentiate the poor white people from the poor black people. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna give white people whiteness. So after the Civil War, in effect, um, Black men uh, could vote. They could uh, e elect people to offices, which they did. They could pass diversity laws, which they did. But that upset the power structure because that meant that they were taking away uh, positions that they thought belonged to them. And so what they said effectively to white men is that we're going to let you do whatever you want to do in order to protect whiteness, in order to get an advantage in this society. Um, Interesting uh, un enough, what they did then was to say, okay, you're white. While they, when they were slaves, they were not white, they were Christians. When, they, when slavery ended, when they were not slaves any longer, they became white. And they used, and whiteness became uh, social uh, capital. It meant that 
if you were in a similar circumstance with other people, if you were white, you should have an advantage over those other people. You were entitled to an advantage of, over other people. And so that began the idea then that just being white was enough for a person to have advantages. It was enough for a person to be in control of other people. It was a right. They've been given this right uh, in order to uh, be better than the people who are not white. Uh, Martin Luther King talks about what a, how much the poor white people had been duped because you cannot eat whiteness. But somehow just the notion of be being better seemed to be enough to uh, keep people happy. The uh, power structure also gave them the myth of white heritage. So where, almost wherever you go, you can find a white Confederate flag. And when you ask a white a person, why are you flying the white Confederate flag? We need to take those down. It's a remnant of the slavery era. They say, well, we're protecting our white heritage. Well, why would anyone want to protect a heritage in which they were enslaved, a heritage in which they didn't have enough food, a heritage in which they had no money, a heritage in which the people who had power and money sent them out to die while they stayed home pretty much and ate uh, tea and crumpets. It's because they've convinced themselves that they actually wanted to, to do this fight, that they were fighting for states' rights. Well, if they were fighting for states' rights, they, they were fighting for the rights of states to define who were slaves and who were not slaves, who were poor, who were not poor. And so that can't be, that can't be a heritage one would want to hold on to unless one has power and one wants to convince other people that that's the, the case. That they uh, had, that they are in fact fighting for something important. They also gave white men, uh, white men with property could always vote for their representatives. White men without property could not. The 15th Amendment we think about as giving uh, black people the vote, it actually gave white men the vote. We know that that's the case because uh, over uh, uh, 1965, so uh, we had to pass particular voting rights acts to give black men the right to vote. And so what that meant is that even if you didn't have property and you were a white man, now you could vote. Now you could put people in office who looked like you. Now you could have the power that the power structure allowed you to have. And then they gave them the white American dream, which of course was a myth. If you work hard and uh, you will achieve the same wealth and riches as the upper level people in the, in the country, the upper level white people in the country. Um, I um, uh, have, we call, I call her my partner in whiteness, Amanda Weber, who's white. And so I ask her, why do, why do people keep believing in this American dream when they don't have the same wealth and power that uh, the upper level wimps have? Why, why don't they protest? Why aren't they demonstrating about that? Why do they vote for people who don't give them power? And she explains it as they're raised to believe in the white American dream. And if you destroy the people who are actually living the white American dream, then that means you have no hope for the dream yourself. And so the white American dream is a, is a, is a theme that lives on in our society. It's a dream that lives on particularly for white American men because they believe that uh, it's possible for them when often it is not. The other uh, obligation, I guess, for being allowed to be people, for being allowed to be white people, is that they have to protect whiteness by any means necessary. One way they protect whiteness is by ensuring that white women produce white children. And so we see nowadays, for instance, that that's what the abortion laws are about. If, you, if white women have to have babies, then you have more white people, they think. And so they're protecting whiteness. Well, all of this uh, combines to form the ideology uh, that I call 
the ideology of white heterosexual male uh, privilege prescribed Christianity and power. Privilege for the upper stratus of white heterosexual males means property, it means money, it means economic resources. Prescribed Christianity means that even if you don't practice Christianity, you have to pretend you do. Even if you don't know which side of the Bible to hold up, you have to pretend that that's your, that's your religion and power. Uh, you will notice that whenever there's an effort to control people, uh, white people don't do it as individuals, they do it as groups. The KKK, the neo-Nazis, they're all groups. So the white heterosexual male privilege prescribed Christianity and power or WIMP ideology. I couldn't use all of those P's because then it would be whippy, whippy, whippy. So the WIMP <laughs> ideology is the, the ideology that asserts that power and privilege are the birthright of white heterosexual males of privilege because they are white men. So all of our laws, economic policies, and educational institutions are designed by white men to protect their power and privilege. Uh, because they are ostensibly heterosexual men, white heterosexual men. Not all white men are actually alpha or property wimps. That's uh, the percentage ranges, if we mean who owns the most money in the country. Some, it ranges from about one to now, I think it's maybe 4% who own essentially all of, all, of, all of the wealth, who control all of the wealth. But we're all socialized to believe that Alpha wimps should be able to uh, define the types of people. They uh, have done it before and they continue to do it. Control the bodies of people. Are, our bodies belong to the power structure. Uh, give benefits. If I want you to do my bidding, I give you a political office or a job or money or a judgeship and you do what you need to do in order to protect your power. Uh, they are entitled to control and shape the minds through education or lack thereof. Uh, remember, uh, during the slavery era, there were, the people who were enslaved, the African people who were enslaved, were not allowed to learn to read. Uh, the ones, uh, and the white people who would teach them to read were severely punished for doing that. If you control a the mind, then the people are dependent on you and then they cannot resist what it is that you do to them. They're also taught to protect white maleness. So that means that in effect, you're not allowed to do or say anything if you have any uh, visibility that uh, interferes with the power structure. It will, it will rain down on you. So if... <laughs> So people who actually benefit from the WIMP structure, uh, alpha WIMPs. So they're the people with the resources who created, uh, who created it. And uh, we all assume that they have legitimate power. They're entitled to have that power. They have reward power. They can give offices and benefits to people. Uh, and when people have uh, offices and benefits, then they also think they have power. There are the WIMP surrogates. Uh, they are the ones who do and say the things to protect power and to get some for themselves. It doesn't, they don't necessarily have to define for themselves what to say because they know what pleases the upper levels of, of the power structure. Aspiring WIMPs, they are emulating WIMPs from afar to gain power themselves. So we think about them as maybe having vicarious power. Often what they see people, white people doing is, or not things that are going to actually get them power. Uh, for example, having weapons, having guns, shooting guns, is not really going to get them the kind of wealth and resources that they can hold on to, uh, even if they're able to get them by taking them from someone for a short amount of time. Then there are WIMP women. WIMP women are white women who do what's necessary to remain in good status with their uh, type of WIMP white heterosexual male with privilege. So if they, particularly if they are in, in marriage relationships, as long as uh, their spouse likes them, as long as uh, that, per that person is willing to share whatever resources uh, he has with them, I'm uh, using the 
gender binary because WIMP is about gender binary. So um, don't be offended that I'm not mentioning the other groups. And so when you see uh, WIMP, white women doing things that are against their interests, you know that they are essentially uh, not aligning with all women, what they're doing is protecting the benefits they get from being associated with whoever the powerful wimps are in their own life. So, um, white boys to men believe their vision of wimp is a birthright. Uh, other boys to men believe that they can achieve wimp status by explicitly and implicitly emulating what they see white men do. They think they can acquire the white American dream. White women share the level of power and privilege of the men in their lives and protected by having white babies, uh, ignoring their own status as people by convenience, uh, socializing their children to be wimps, and using wimp weapons to protect their whiteness. Uh, when uh, we see news accounts of white women calling the police because uh, black people are barbecuing in the park, that everyone uses to barbecue uh, uh, in, we know that they are using their WIMP weapon. What they're doing is using racism to uh, protect whiteness, to protect the white environment. These are the WIMP weapons. When it, when it looks like someone, some group, some uh, entities are about to gain some of the WIMP power, what happens is that it distresses the upper levels of the power structure and the other wimps who think that they have access to power. And so the wimp weapons are the isms, uh, just some of which are uh, racism, sexism, ageism, anti-Semitism, uh, uh, classism, the phobias, uh, xenophobia, hom uh, Islamophobia, uh, transphobia, homophobia, um, and dehumanization, othering minimizing gun violence, police violence, shooting children. Uh, these these uh, weapons, the reason we call them whip, wimp lash is because they keep popping up. And so when we think that one issue is being addressed, then something else pops up and then something else pops up. So for example, uh, uh, which one should I choose? Let's, let's do, let's do uh, ageism to start. And let's suppose that, um, let's do a hypothetical example. Suppose we had an old white man running for president who has a black uh, vice president. <laughs> now, it would, it would be racist or, and sexist to say, uh, we think he's going to die and that black woman is going to be in charge. So, what, what, what happens? People attack him because of his age. They say he's too old. Now we have had presidents who uh, were dying in office and people knew that they were dying in office, but uh, that was okay because uh, he had a white vice president. We had a president who was demonstrating Alzheimer's symptoms during his uh, debate. He just blanked out, but that was okay. He had a white vice president, even though the pre vice president couldn't spell potato. <laughs> so if you're anticipating that um, this hypothetical, oh, white man is going to die, well, he has a vice president. What's the problem? So in effect, when I say I presented these as separate, but they all interact in significant ways to protect whiteness in our society. Uh, xenophobia, uh, fear for, of uh, foreigners. There's no fear of people who come from the north of the United States. And in fact, most of the people who are uh, undocumented uh, immigrants come from Europe. But the ones that we are concerned with not me, the ones they are concerned with are the immigrants of color. And so then we have uh, the racism intersecting with the phobia. Um, dehumanization uh, inter intersects with uh, 
uh, sexism. So we have, we have, for example, now the pop-up issue is uh, who decides whether there could be in vitro fertilization? Well, of course, women don't decide that. Do they think it's their bodies or something? Why heterosexual males with privilege decide that? Uh, and in fact, the what they decide is that um, women, the woman who potentially is carrying the baby, is less important than the baby who can't live unless she unless she implants it in some way, has it implanted in some way. So the weapons intersect and they keep popping up. And when we think we're dealing with one issue, we're dealing with all of the issues at the same time. And so we need to not be distracted. We need to always say, say well, what are you doing about this, this issue while you're focusing on this issue and this issue and this issue? They're, they're enough to keep us distracted. They're enough of us to be able to fight the distraction. All of these issues occur on uh, three levels. They occur on the uh, individual level. So how do you actually think about uh, people uh, who are not uh, white heterosexual males, for that matter? How do you think about them? Uh, the weapons, however, are intended to make people who don't have power feel bad about themselves. So they're the attitudes or the beliefs that we have that define us as being uh, not not good fits for the system. Uh, interpersonal, how we engage with, with one another, uh, how uh, who do we associate with, what kinds of interactions do we have with people, and then of course there are the laws and the policies. Individuals uh, control interpersonal relationships, uh, both individuals and interpersonal relationships control laws. Laws are not born by themselves, and if we were to uh, join forces at the individual and the interpersonal levels, we could actually change the laws that we don't like. Although there there's many weapons, my focus is going to be racism as a wimp uh, weapon. And I choose that one because many historians talk about uh, racism, particularly black white racism, although I would also include black uh, Native American racism as original sins. And so if you don't deal with original sins, you just keep sinning. And for some people that's important, but for, uh, or for some people that feels good, but for others of us, it doesn't. So that gets us to the Supreme Court and the affirmative action case. Now we have a Supreme Court that's uh, predominantly comprised of uh, wimp justices, uh, either white heterosexual male uh, justices with a uh, privilege or a, a surrogate wimp and a wimp woman. What that means is that we can, we can see, we can know in advance what decisions they will make. The decisions will be decisions that will protect the white power structure. So you want to see how that works. I don't, I don't know if you know that there was a recent Supreme case that people think about as ending affirmative action. In the case, um, Harvard uh, University and the University of North Carolina were sued because it was said that they were uh, admitting uh, black students and his quote unquote Hispanic students. And by doing so, they were depriving uh, in the case of Harvard, Asian students, uh, and in the case of uh, UNC, white students, they, we were depriving them of their opportunities for an education. Each of these institutions had a history of being predominantly white institutions, and one could make an argument that each of these institutions had a history of discriminating against Black and uh, Latinx people. The court, in making its decision, said that it was going to use the Equal Protection Clause. Now, the Equal Protection Clause, it's the uh, 14th Amendment, is called the Civil Rights Amendment, was intended to give uh, 
uh, black people, actually, civil rights in the country. And so it says that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor to deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, we know that that didn't cover black people because even though theoretically they had been freed from enslavement, they weren't citizens. And the way I know that they weren't citizens is that I've been, I've been tracing my roots. And so I looked at the census uh, data for some of my ancestors who were here uh, post-Civil War. And there used to be, there might still be a box on the census record that says, is this person a citizen? The, my black ancestors, there was no check mark for citizenship. My ancestors who were uh, not black, there was a check mark for citizenship. And so uh, the census uh, actually has a note that says, even though black people were free, they did not become citizens until later in the uh, 1900s. Okay, so we know that they weren't talking about black people. We also know that if they had been talking about black people, they would have said all black people are born or naturalized in the United States, but they didn't say that. We also don't know who they meant by the state, or for that matter, the United States. But what we do know is that they are saying in this uh, equal protection clause that whoever the United States is, whoever the states are, uh, they control us. They determine what the law is, they determine the circumstances under which any person uh, uh, has life, liberty, and property. And so if we don't recognize that they're using uh, ambiguous language to talk about their power, then we might not notice that it's there. Uh, what we want to do then is to begin to think about, uh, we want to make WIMP power explicit. So we need a, a definition of persons. We need the definition of states. We need a different a definition of laws. Races, race and racism is hidden in this uh, equal protection clause. And so we don't really know that it's intended to protect people against racism. Well, the Supreme Court is going to help us out here. Uh, in, in its narrative before the decision, and I just chose one excerpt because I didn't want to uh, bore you too much, but it says, to achieve the educational benefits of diversity, respondents, meaning uh, Harvard and UNC, measure the racial composition of their classes using racial categories that are plainly overbroad, expressing, for example, the Supreme Court is really with it, expressing, for example, no concern whether South Asian or East Asian students are adequately represented as Asian. Arbitrary or undefined terms, the use of the category Hispanic or under inclusive, no category at all for Middle Eastern stu uh, students. The unclear connection between the goals that respondents seek and the means they employ uh, preclude courts from meaningfully uh, recruiting respondent, uh, scrutinizing respondents' admissions programs. And so they decided to do it meaninglessly. So if we look at what they've done, they engaged in what in whataboutism. Uh, it's really important, for example, what uh, uh, South Asians, uh, East uh, Asian students, uh, uh, and the other maybe 30 categories of Asians, how that is important what their experiences are in the educational system. It's also important to know that the category of Hispanic does not describe the various ethnic groups that are, uh, uh, I would say, Latinx. Middle Eastern students are, uh, uh, are supposed to be one of the white groups. There's, uh, and so it's important to know what the experience of being a Middle Eastern student is on campuses. But 
to say that they are important and we need to consider their issues also means that when you engage in whataboutism, you're not attending to the issue of black white racism, which was supposed to be the reason why the Equal Protection Clause existed. So if you look at this, you can ask, well, who is missing? Who is it that they're not concerned about? Well, one group of people they're not concerned about is uh, black people. We could say that um, uh, they could have said, for example, well, you didn't include black people and there are different kinds of black people. There are, uh, did somebody raise their hand? Black people, uh, they didn't include Jamaicans or Haitians or Ethiopians or any of the other ethnic groups of black people that are living in this country now. They didn't say that. Well, who else is missing? White people. They didn't include all the, the ethnic groups that could be white people, uh, uh, Irish, Italian, English, and so on. So what they are doing is, uh, uh, in effect, deciding what institutions sh should do. What they're doing is they're minimizing the reason why the laws exist, uh, supposedly. And what they're doing is distracting us so that we, we will fight with each other. Uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to look at this and say, well, uh, uh, the uh, Asian students, et cetera, are being deprived. And that's probably true. But if we, in fact, don't deal with the issues as separate issues, then we don't find out that the resolutions might be different resolutions. Well, guess what? The government defines what the racial groups are. Uh, it's actually the US Office of Management and Budget who does that for us. And for any racial category, for any uh, racial report, race-related report, for any race-related laws, the categories are defined as American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, uh, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and white. No ethnicities in there, but don't worry, the OMB handled that for us. There are two ethnicity categories, Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino. Now, what the Supreme Court was essentially saying is, although all of these government agencies use these categories or are required to use these categories, when you're thinking about admitting students to college, you can't use these categories, they're too broad. Well, whose fault is that? So this was the affirmative action decision, uh, whimplashing, uh, written by our friend John Roberts. Uh, Robert says, because Harvard's and UNC's admissions programs lack sufficiently focused and measurable object objectives uh, warranting the use of race, uh, they said, for example, that they wanted to have classes that had diverse opinions. They wanted to be able to train students who were able to interact with a variety of people when they left the university and so on. Uh, the Supreme Court thought that, that those objectives couldn't be measured. And they thought that um, Harvard and UNC were uh, using race in a negative manner, which uh, is forbidden. You're not allowed to do that. And their, negative, uh, their example of using race in a negative manner is that both uh, Harvard and UNC uh, evaluated students' credentials, but they also included uh, consideration of the student's background as represented by their racial group membership. Um, what the Supreme Court said is that if you admit a black or a Latino student based on their racial group membership, even if they have all of these other qual qualifications, uh, you are discriminating against the students who don't get in. And their definition of the students who don't get in, if that happens, uh, was the Asian students. I doubt that that was really their concern, given that all of the other cases before this have been about uh, white students complaining that uh, 
Black and Latinx students are taking their places in the university. But anyway, uh, that's what Robert said. And there's no end point. In some of the early uh, decisions where it was agreed that race could be considered an affirmative action, uh, they have said that it should end by 2028. And the Supreme Court said, well, it's not going to end by 2028, and so let's not do it anymore. So what they said then is that the programs were uh, in conflict with the Equal Protection Clause. But don't worry, they gave us a way to, to uh, get past that. What they said was nothing prohibits universities from considering the applicant's uh, discussion of how race affected the applicant's life. So then you have to ask the question, who has race? Do whites have race? And are whites being required to discuss how their race affected their life? I was a member of the KKK and it affected my life greatly. <laughs> so long as that discussion is, con is uh, concretely tied to a quality of character or unique ability that the particular applicant can contribute to the university. Okay, so now not only do you have to uh, have had experiences of racism effectively, but you have to tell the, the admissions committee how your experiences of racism made you a wonderful person, improved your character. Do white people have to talk about how racism made them worthwhile people, improve their character? I think not. So what we have now is that the Supreme Court is establishing a standard for people of color that is not the same standard for white people. And then to top it off, they, uh, they uh, stereotype. Many universities have for too long wrongly concluded that this uh, touchstone of uh, individual's identity, I thought they were gonna talk about racial identity, but they didn't. This touchstone of an individual's identity uh, is, is not challenged best, but is not challenges bested, skills built or lessons learned, but the color of their skin. So they're effectively saying the university is admitting uh, black and Latinx students who don't have any, uh, haven't uh, overcome any challenges, they don't have any skills and they haven't learned any lessons. You're just taking them because they're people of color. That's stereotyping. And finally, to, just to make us happy, they say this constitutional, uh, this uh, constitutional history does not tolerate that choice. Now, in what people's world have white people not been admitted to institutions on the basis of their skin color? To say that that's not our history is essentially to to lie to us. And so there we are. We have a uh, group of white people, white, primarily white heterosexual males and uh, women surrogates who make decisions. We didn't vote for any of those people. And so they're making decisions about us based on what they think, how they think we should, we should uh, exist. They're controlling us by uh, uh, their, their sense of who we should be. So what do, we, what do we do about that? The true answer to that is, I don't know. <laughs> but I'd like us to at least think about that. Because it occurs to me that um, one way we begin to do, to change something is to recognize the ways in which uh, WIMP is operating, WIMP Lash is operating, whether at the individual, the intergroup, or the systemic levels. Yes, as a, as a therapist, we, say, we often say that uh, insight is the beginning of change. And so if we can begin to call out what we see, then maybe we can initiate some change. So uh, when someone says, for example, let's make laws against uh, transgender people, uh, why don't we say, well, what part of your manhood does transgenderism challenge? What aspect of your power is a wimp to set challenge? 
we can also stay woke. Uh, in African American history, woke is the term that's used to essentially advise us, advise African Americans to be aware of the ways in which racism influences our lives so that we don't internalize that belief system. But we have seen recently that uh, woke has been a, a matter of uh, considerable interest in the political system. So we want to begin to reinforce for Black people that woke has a meaning for them that's different from the meaning it has for white people. We want to also welcome other people in, of color into the web by saying it has a different meaning for you than it might have for white people. And I want to also welcome in the uh, recovering wimps who are white people and let them know that it also has a different meaning for them. Because in effect, if you are recovering from WIMP, if you are challenging the political system, if you're challenging the power structure, even if you're white, the system is going to shut down on you in one way or another. So you need to stay woke as well. We need to say the words black, white when we mean racial groups. Now, not only black, whites, but when we're talking about blacks and whites, we should use the words black and white. And the reason we want to do that is because that's where the history essentially starts. And if you don't recognize the that's where the history starts, then you don't understand that every issue that's considered to be a black issue is also a white issue in our society because that's where the power structure is. We also want to uh, begin to consider how we can fight. How, how can we change the system? How can we make it different? Um, I call attention to uh, uh, two of my personal heroes, Ruby Freeman and uh, Shea Moss. Uh, if you recall, they were black women during the last election who were tormented in order to secure power for the white heterosexual male with power and privilege who was running for office. They stood up, they fought, they won, a, they won uh, uh, a considerable money from uh, one of the participants in their harassment. Unfortunately, they probably won't get it because she's now bankrupt, but at least they, they tried, they fought, they made their, their case visible. And finally, we need to define woke for white wimps. Um, it's, it's, it's customary in, in our society for uh, wimps to take the language of people of color, the culture of people of color, and make it their own. Well, let's just re redefine woke for the people who are for this anti-woke movement. Uh, when you ask white people who are in power, what does it mean? They say, what, is, what does woke mean? What is this anti-woke policy? And I don't know, I just know it's not good. Well, we're gonna make it even uh, worse for them to be anti-woke. Right, so let's say that W equals whites, O equals obtaining, uh, uh, K equals knowledge about, and E equals egregious racism, sexism, transgenderism, and so on. So if you are woke, then you can know something about all of these, these things. If you're anti-woke, you're ignorant, and ignorance is a scary thing. Um, that's my story. Not that I'm ignorant, but that's the end. I'm going to, we're just going to get mic'd up and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then we're going to open it up for folks in the room to ask questions and the person who's moderating the uh, webinar will text me questions from there to ask. Thank you again. That was so interesting, and I just love the development of your research. Can you all just join me again in thanking Dr. Helms? This is beautiful.
And you all will be, um, especially for those folks who are graduate students, this is one of the moments it'll be like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Do you remember when we saw that Dr. Helms talk? This will be the thing to, that you'll be remembering and talking about. I so appreciate the clarity of the vision of your message and how you make visible that which is hidden and you make it visible through history and legal studies, which many times psychologists and counseling psychologists in particular don't particularly do. So I thought that was a beautiful example there. And I, I'm loving the WIMP model, how you talk about beneficiaries and the weapons and the attacks and the original sin is racism. I'm really glad that you um, included affirmative action because that is such a critical justice issue at this moment that counseling psychologists need to be intervening and I appreciate the education there. Um, I couldn't help but to think if, um, if I said what I said was a lecture, I think that this would be it. So one of the things, questions that I have for you is you've gone from looking at white racial identity um, in the 80s and Ford and now to WIMP. And um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the journey from moving from white racial identity to WIMP and kind of the context in which you were thinking about white racial identity and the context in which you were developing your WIMP model. I just wanted to see how your thoughts and thinkings have been changed um, over time. Well, I haven't actually moved from white racial identity. Uh, <laughs> I only had 45 minutes. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> the, the, sec the second part of the presentation is how white racial identity pertains to wokeness. Uh, so it's, it's still there. But the reason I want us to focus on uh, WIMP is because WIMP occurs at the systemic level. And so I talk about individual, interpersonal, and systemic. At the uh, racial identity is more often used at the interpersonal level. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be used at the systemic level, but it's more used at the personal level. So I wanted people to begin to think about who keeps us in the turmoil that requires us to have any racial identity models, actually. And as I began to think about that, and uh, look at how things work and to recognize that I always knew in advance how any court decision was going to turn out uh, simply by saying who's going to benefit in the end. So then I began to think about, well, who has the power? And so it's just a matter of making that power uh, more explicit, making it as explicit for other people as it seemed to be to me. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. And thanks for the correction. Like you've, it, a white racial identity is still a core piece of yours. And I appreciate hearing a little bit about how thinking through individual processes and interpersonal processes to larger structural and institutional processes that WIMP begins to, to look at. So uh, appreciate that. At the end here, you talk a little bit about how, um, how we can dismantle WIMP. And I, uh, I thought this was really important. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the ways you've observed WIMP showing up in counseling psychology or psychology in general, and what we can do to dismantle WIMP in our profession. That's a big one. <laughs> uh, actually, you might know the answer to that one better than I. <laughs> but I, I would just say that we all in, exist in WIMP structures. And so if we look, for example, at uh, the ethical codes that we have to follow as counseling psychologists, they are not ethical, they're such um, hierarchical ethical codes. Mm -hmm. They don't take into account the ways in which we actually engage. Mm -hmm. And so a part of changing the system is di diversifying the system so that in effect, how those of us who are not entitled to power see the world and how we can change it so that entitlement to power doesn't become the core issue. Uh, other ways I see it is certainly um, now that we have the affirmative action uh, decision, it's going to be harder to decide who to admit into counseling psychology programs now. How, how, can, how can you do that? And so that means, for example, that we're going to have to do some pretty risky things. We might, for example, not be using standardized tests anymore for the purposes of admitting, admitting people into counseling psychology programs. So we have to become radical. Mm -hmm. 
uh, other ways, uh, systems are often set up, counseling psychology in particular, so that the funding resources that are the best resources are not going to people of color. Uh, and so we want to be able to think about how we are dispensing the opportunities in our division, uh, regardless of the powerfulness or the origins of the people that we are admitting into counseling psychology. That's off the top of my head. We've, oh. we've already done some good things, however. We have you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we, uh, we actually did have an African-American president before you. Um, uh, and so integrating this, the power structure, so to speak, uh, is a way that I think we begin to change what happens, what happens in the institution. I really appreciate those in terms of representations of who's in power. You were referencing Dr. Siobhan Moore Laban, who did an amazing job. And, and part of her whole presidency was to begin to think explicitly about um, dismantling anti Black racism. So I have a first question here. So I'm going to ask the question from um, the webinar folks. And then we're going to go ahead and open it up for a question from the audience. And we'll go back to the webinar. We'll come back to the audience that way. That um, So the first question is, what history book would you suggest to study for the 1600 to 1800s era in America? Uh, did I not show my reference list? I don't think you showed your reference list. Oh, well, there's a reference list okay. at the end of my presentation. Okay. okay. Uh, which, which uh, for me, was really um, a fun reading because I suppose that some of them were written by uh, uh, white men, I don't know, but mm -hmm. judging from the names, I'm guessing it. And so what you have is that them, be, them being really angry that their history has been hidden, and you have them be, being really angry at African Americans for, for doing better d during slavery than the white slaves did. Um, they say they didn't feed the white slaves, I don't know, but that's what they say. Mm -hmm. But they're not blaming the power structure that put all of them in that position. And so I found myself chuckling. Well, why, why, are, you, why are you complaining? Uh, because they pay more for the African Americans than they do you. They shouldn't be paying for either one of you. And so uh, it's, it's, you'll, be, you'll find it an interesting read. You, ha you have to approach it with a certain, amount of, a certain amount of humor, regardless of whether you are a white person or a person of color, because uh, uh, it just shows how people um, uh, or affected by a system that wants to cover up its past. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we'll definitely make those available for folks so that you can look at the references. But I also appreciate the notion of being really critical about what you read and how you read it. And I think you modeled this for us when you went through the legal case and how you understand that. And always going back to like who benefits from this and who loses out. So, you, um, so thank you for that. And we will definitely make that available. Well, we'd like to open it up for folks for a question here in the audience, and then we'll. Hello. Can I go? Or what? Yeah. Hi, Janet. How are you? Hi. Cool. Um, thank you for being here. Um, Dr. Helms was on my dissertation when I was at College Park, so I really love and appreciate her. Um, I am an industrial and organizational psychologist by training, but I don't claim all of that. As IO psychologists and organization development specialists, we really try to work with systems change in addition to the individual um, change. My own personal uh, theoretical framework is internal change first and then impacting the system change. But what would you suggest to have both fields work cooperatively together or, or you know, because system people say, well, you can't just focus on individual. Individual people, sometimes it takes a long time for change to affect if you don't get them to impact the system. But what do you see happening, and what would you suggest that both feel do to work more collaboratively? Um, it, well, if, if I, if I um, understand the question, the, the issue is that in organizations, organizations change slowly. But um, and that's 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 uh, true. 
but organizations only exist because the people in them uh, allow them to exist. And so I think sometimes what we have to do is we just start with a people, a couple of people who are interested in changing the organizations. Can't just be one because then that person can be ostracized. But if you can find a group of people who say, we want to make this one change. And so you work towards making that one change. It is true that it may, it may, take, it may take some time. Uh, change is slow in coming, but it's gonna come. And so what you, what you wanna do is to work on changing something that you see is core to what's dysfunctional about the organizational structure. As you change it, uh, the interesting thing is that things will probably begin to work better and somebody's gonna become receptive to maybe thinking about some more changes in the organization. And so don't think about it as having to change the whole structure. Think about it as what can we as a small collective begin to change now? Thank you. There's a, yeah. Testing. I'm not, I'm not answering any questions for you. I made sure it was a hot <laughs> mic. <laughs> so Aunt Janet, I got a question for you. <laughs> I'm like the adopted nephew. Okay, my, my name is Dr. Hank Boyd. I teach over in the business school, so you may have seen me over at Van Munching Hall. So, no one has seen you. Uh, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the point you raise, you have to challenge the system. You have to call it out black and white. It dawned on me that when Nicole Hannah-Jones, that whole debacle that went down at her alma mater, UNC, she should have been made tenure professor, 1619 project done. But there was one white wimp back there with power saying, no, I don't want her to have it. They changed the nature of her position. And she even said that, look, they were doing this thing to me and I tried to keep it under wraps. I was embarrassing and all this sort of stuff. It seems to be that transparency is the tonic. If you can pull things out into the light, then you can have some real change. Sadly, when I think of some of the things like Rodney King, when I think of George Floyd, it had to happen in visible where people could see it. And when it was dragged out into the sunlight, then everyone's like, oh, this is wrong, we're gonna do something. So what is it gonna take for us? I'm sure many people here, things have happened. You think, well, if I'm quiet and I go along, it'll be okay. But it seems like we have to challenge the system at all points and to pull its ugliness out into the light. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I think you're, I agree with you. I think we need to make things visible. But I also think we have the problem that people who are not really wimps, but think that if they are quiet, they can become wimps, don't join the fight. So uh, uh, when George Floyd, for example, was murdered for, for 10 seconds, non-wimp people said, well, I never knew that that thing happened. That, I feel really bad about that. And then they went back, back home. Where, where were they when the, the, their representatives didn't pass the George Floyd uh, Anti-Violence Act? Nowhere. So I think what happens is that there is a tendency for people who are not a member of the particular group, and in, in our case, this today is the black group. It could be an Asian group, it could be any group. I think when members are not a member of that group, they don't recognize that they should fight for that group too because if they fight for that group too, then in effect they are influencing what happens to them. So I wanna know where were her white colleagues? It couldn't have been just one white wimp who said, I don't want you to be promoted. Her white colleagues let that happen too. And so somebody needs to call them out and say, where were you? Why didn't you support her? Mm, powerful. To the point, that's what uh, the clarity, um, I appreciate that. Here's um, a question from the webinar. Um, have you received any whimplash uh, to this new framework? Uh, well, depends on how you define it. Uh, so far, the major whimplash is that why men walk out of my presentation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's okay. If you get, if the people who stay get the message, then they'll be sorry they walked out. Okay, okay, great. Awesome. Um, are, is there another question in the audience? Okay. Thank you for your talk. I'm here. Um, you, you focused on Wimplash in the US context, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit to how Wimplash works 
as a in a global system as a global system well no actually i can't do that because uh two things what when, when is that that's that's a kind of what about it ism and so i try not to do that uh but the other reason i won't do that is because i don't really know how whiplash works in a global system um and i think one of the problems with psychology in general is that we assume what we do applies to everyone in the world and so what i hope happens with my constructs is that people on a global level say well does this make sense to me given the context in which i'm functioning or does it not make sense to me um, uh, although uh, my colleagues make me sound like i'm uh, grandiose and can do anything in fact uh, i only live in this context and so i'm not really skilled in telling people in other parts of the world how they should live their lives Really interesting response. And it also reminds me of people from the global south really encourage us to actually talk about psychologies to represent like what we have in this Western world is psychology doesn't represent all of the psychologies around the globe. And it's an important lesson. Um, here's another question from the um, a webinar folks. Um, what forms of whiplash have you, Dr. Helms, witnessed across your career that are most prominent within higher education and specifically counseling psychology graduate programs? I'm not sure you want to call folks out, but they're just, <laughs> it sounds as though folks want to know, has you had any experience with whiplash in your own professional career and development that you feel comfortable sharing with us? Well. <laughs> <laughs> the, the short answer to that is I'm a black woman. That you're a black woman? Yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, I think it's impossible to be a black woman in the higher educational system without experiencing whiplash. Uh, so uh, you actually talked about some of the whiplash uh, where uh, when I presented particularly, well, actually, when I presented the black racial identity model and the people of color identity models, the editors would essentially turn me down and say, how do you know white people don't have identities? Why aren't you studying white people's identities? Uh, so then I started studying white people's identities and they said, well, uh, white people don't have an identity. Why are you studying white people's identity? So it was kind of uh, negotiating those systems. Uh, you, you may know that I uh, also do uh, racial bias and standardized testing. Uh, reviewers when I you have to to be promoted to a professor you have to publish stuff and so I would submit things and uh, the editors would would say uh, in effect where'd you get your education you don't know what you're talking about <laughs> uh, we're not accepting this and so a lot of the uh, uh, when I published the book that you cited with Dr. Cook uh, Harcourt Brace shut down their whole division on diversity because they did not want to publish the book. So I've experienced I, I've experienced whiplash in different ways. Um, I, there are other ways that maybe I shouldn't share in public, but <laughs> there have been a variety of ways. Great, thank you. Uh, appreciate that, and I'm sure all the other Black women who are in academia are like, yes, yes, and yes, we understand what you're saying. But appreciate that. There's a question over. But, but actually, let me let me give you the Black women's one one whiplash thing that a lot of us probably share. Regar regardless of what your personality style is, at some point, some white heterosexual male in your institution is going to say, you can't have this because you are an aggressive Black woman. People, are, yes, <laughs> I hear a lot of yes and head nods. Great, awesome, thank you. There's a question over here. I'm also a little bit, I'm on the tail end. I sound worse than I feel. Um, uh, my name is Rabbi Atuberi. I'm an assistant professor here in the Family Science Department, but I'm a psychologist, I'm a counseling psychologist by training. Um, and so this is actually a training question on, in the same vein. So as we're training students, and I think I'm maybe less concerned with the um, old white guard of our profession and thinking more about how we train our students. Um, and a lot of times in training students, we bring them in and they take a diversity class and we do these ju social justice things and training them. And kind of what is our role in gatekeeping who gets to be psychologists? Because there's a lot of times students 
they not quite getting it, but how can, what do we say in maybe thinking about a remediation plan or even dismissing students? Um, what does that look like? How do we measure students' journey in air quotes, cultural competence and grasping some of these concepts and the way they understand their work? Because not getting it means they could harm people um, as psychologists. And so what is our role as professors and people who are training students in gatekeeping, or if it is that our role in deciding who gets to become a psychologist and engage with the public? Um, I, I, I think we don't really have a very good definition of what competence means. Um, and so we have all sorts of professional guidelines and standards but as you, as I look at those professional guidelines and standards, they don't seem to fit. Uh, they don't seem to fit the people I've trained, regardless of the race ethnicity of the people I've trained. They they don't they don't have humanity. And so I think what what I always try to do when I train students to be competent is to encourage them to keep their humanity. And that's kind of hard to do when there are there are all of the rules in place that say you have to do X or you have to do Y in order to be a professional. And I think as trainers, it's our responsibility to know who our students are as people. We can't we can't always know who they are. Some students don't want us to know who they are, but it's our responsibility to try to know who they are and then to in some ways work with the, the standards so that they can get what they need out of that system and then go on to be the real people that they're supposed to be. Mm. Thank you. I mean, I really yeah, resonate with the notions about humanization. And I think your model incorporates aspects of the way the WIMP model dehumanizes people. Um, here's one also that is a training question as well is, uh, can the WIMP model be utilized in therapy sessions? And if so, how? Um, I, I think again, I think um, I, it depends on uh, who the client is, but in essence, the general theme for everyone is to make the WIMP uh, visible. So what is it about the client's presenting problem that, uh, how, how, how is that related to their WIMP socialization? We're all socialized in a WIMP system. And so sometimes I catch myself even saying, Oh my goodness, that was that was whiplashing and I didn't recognize it. And so it's becoming aware of the ways in, in which WIMP influence ourselves as well as the people that we, we work with. And so I'm hoping, for instance, showing the strategies that people that WIMPs use will help people to begin to think about that. Mm -hmm. And the strategies that we use because we've been socialized to emulate WIMPs in order to have access to resources. Ain't that the truth, right? Um, thank you. We have, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions from the audience here. And I have a question here. So we have about five more minutes. So there's somebody in the front here who would. So maybe we'll take both questions given time. So we'll hear your question first and hear the second question. And then Dr. Helms, if you can, you know, um, synthesize and answer those that be. Um, I just as a young black woman looking to kind of break through in these spaces, it's, I'm really having a hard time understanding how to look for wimp lashes and in the essence of basically how to build yourself up. Like, am I supposed to go into these spaces and expect that? Um, I'm looking to pr uh, potentially become a PhD candidate myself. And so I'm just, it's been interesting to hear a lot of the reactions in agreeance to facing um, wet blashes in higher ed. And so I'm just trying to understand, is this something that I even want to get myself into? Um, did you want me to hear both okay. questions? Yeah, hear both questions, yeah. This is kind of an aside. There are many clinical and counseling psychologists that become certified coaches because they leave the counseling and the therapeutic modality and they want to make money in organization and leaders. And I'm interested in what would you encourage 
those counseling psychologists to bring with them when they become coaches because in most organizations be they talk a lot of lip service about being keen and um changing in diversity but most people a lot of people in organizations are scared to point out wimpish behavior for fear of their jobs and i think many psychologists are coming into the profession not so much i see the change individuals and system but really try to make a lot of money on <laughs> the ones i run into and i'm really concerned about that uh, uh, so any thoughts around that any responses you know it's just a situation not that you're gonna fix it okay i don't know if i can synthesize them uh, but let me let me just say um yes when you enter uh higher education, you should expect it to be a WIMP environment because that's how it's designed. But in effect, all of the environments we exist in are WIMP environments. And so you can't choose an environment because you want to avoid it, because if you do that, then I don't know where you live. So you just kind of have to remember that uh, although at the moment the structure is a WIMP structure, we actually own it. We were here first. And so we need to then change it to reflect who we are. And if you know that you're entering a WIMP system, then you can defend against it. If you don't know that you're entering a WIMP system, then you're ignorant and ignorance is scary. So I, I, what, I, what I regularly do actually is to practice looking for WIMP so that I know how it appears and so I'm not surprised about it. And then if good non whip things happen, then I'm really happy and surprised because I wasn't expecting those to happen in that particular context. The counseling psychologists are living the white American dream. And so then you, the white American dream, make a lot of money, be at the top. And so in some sense, that's, uh, I don't know that uh, you or I can change them. I think one could certainly point out that that's what they're doing, but they probably know it and they probably like it. And so that's, that's their choice. I'm actually not about taking choice away from people because that would make me a wimp. I'm about allowing people to see where their options are and then they have to make decisions for themselves. I'm gonna have one more question I'm gonna ask you from the webinar and then after you respond to that, if you could share any closing thoughts and then I'm going to invite Dr. Lewis to the stage. But this last question, um, I think piggybacks on these last two questions that we have and could you speak to burnout when working for change within systems? Um, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, you will burn out, uh, <laughs> but you are only allowed to burn out for a short time. And so uh, 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 our Racism Recovery tool act, Toolkit, what we say is you have to find essentially uh, things and people that help you to resolve your burnout, that give you strength and nurturance so that uh, you can recover. And then you have to recognize that you have an obligation to get back into the fight. Uh, you get to decide when to do it, but uh, somewhere in the back of your mind, you must always have the thought, I have to get back into the fight because I owe it to my ancestors, mm. whoever your ancestors were. Powerful. And do you have some closing thoughts for us? Uh, my closing thoughts. I wasn't planning to give closing thoughts. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I guess my closing thoughts would be that um, I appreciate you all not throwing tomatoes at me. <laughs> uh, particularly since I was talking about WIMP during the last day of uh, Black History Month. But I think it's really important that we recognize the extent to which Black history is also the history of all of the people in the United States who think about themselves as as uh, Americans. And so if we don't talk about them, if we don't talk about all of the issues, then in effect, we're, we lose our power. And so what I'm hoping that I've accomplished today, at least, is to give people a sense of how we can begin to claim some power, to claim, 
claim some structure, to claim some resources for ourselves because we're entitled. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Oh, thank you so much again for your powerful words, um, Dr. Um, Neville and Dr. Helms. Just really appreciate the conversation. Um, so now I would like to introduce two representatives from the College of Education and the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences who would each like to share a few words about Dr. Helms and her impact on the field of counseling psychology, the counseling psychology program at UMD, the UMD community. Um, so I'm going to briefly read both of their bios and then they'll each come up. So Dr. William Ming Liu is a professor of counseling psychology and chair of the Department of Counseling, Higher Education, and Spe Special Education. His research is focused on social class and classism, men and masculinities, and white supremacy and privilege. He has written several books and is co-authoring a forthcoming book titled Systems of White Supremacy and White Privilege, a Racial Spatial Framework for Psychology from Oxford University Press. He's also the 2022 recipient of the Janet E. Helms Mentoring Award and from the Winter Roundtable to, uh, Teachers College, Columbia University. Dr. Liu is also um, somebody who earned his doctoral degree in the counseling psychology program here at the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Kim Nickerson is currently the Assistant Dean for Diversity and the Diversity Officer for the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. He plays a leadership role in maximizing the educational and career outcomes of the college's students, faculty, and staff, as well as helping to foster diversity and inclusion. He's also an equity administrator and helps to, provoke, to promote and coordinate campus-wide diversity recruitment efforts. He earned his doctorate in clinical psychology at the University of North Texas and also um, did postdoctoral training here at the University of Maryland working under the mentorship of Dr. Helms. So we could welcome both of them up. First we'll have Dr. Liu come up and then Dr. Nickerson. Thank you. Um, first I want to thank Dr. Lewis for this incredible organization or organizing of this event. Uh, she just took so much time and care in bringing um, Dr. Helms and Dr. Neville to our campus. And I just want to thank her for um, her service. I also bring greetings from our dean. Dean Griffin is um, was so honored to be able to sponsor the event tonight, um, but she's so sorry she couldn't attend. Uh, for, she has another engagement, but she, uh, when I told her about the date and you were coming to present, um, she quickly jumped at, you know, how can I support this event? Because she, she knew very uh, deeply how important the, um, the program was and the, and the discussion as well. So I want to uh, just send greetings from uh, Dr. Griffin, uh, Dean Griffin to us. So. Um, Dr. Helms was a professor here when I was a graduate student not too long ago. It's, uh, it feels like it, it's in the 90s, so if for those of you, it was in the 90s when she was a professor here, and um, uh, I was a graduate student here, and um, it, when I think back about that time as a graduate student and you were a professor here, uh, it's amazing how much you put up with in this program. If you think about the epistemological hold that the faculty had, the program had on the field, as well as the deep-seated racism that you experienced, you have to understand, you have to appreciate who you are as a person, as a scholar, as a researcher. And I want you to know, now that I'm a journal editor, I'll publish your stuff. So if you want to send it to me, <laughs> I, won't send, I won't give you the questions that they, that they had. So I appreciate 
you. And I appreciate Dr. Neville and our professional paths pass crossing again, and we sort of came up professionally at the same time. So I just want to say thank you to Dr. Neville for her service to the profession and her strength in speaking truth and power to power to be able to speak about peace and liberation and to withstand the racism that you experienced as well. So I appreciate you. So thank you very much. I just want to say that. Um, I'm so honored to have both of you here joining us uh, this evening. Um, I just want to provide you, give you this gift from our Dean's office. And thank you for, and thank you, Janet. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, and before I forget, Dr. Helms is part of a webinar uh, that's going to happen on March 15th from the Psychologist for Racial Justice. It's called, If Race is a Social Construction, Why Does It Matter So Much? So that's on March 15th. It's a virtual conference done by the Psychologist for Racial Justice. And so you'll see advertisements uh, and other things coming along. And Dr. Helms will be presenting there as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Dr. Helms, on behalf of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences and the Department of Psychology, we just want to offer our gratitude for what you've meant to the University of Maryland and our college. I know that there are many of our faculty members and probably students from the Department of Psychology whose careers wouldn't be where they are without you. And we talk about it a lot. As for me, 32 years ago, 92, this giant of an intellectual figure took a little old country boy from Texas and completely changed my life. She turned me into a scientist. And if any of you know who I am, and if you come to my office, you'll see her photo hanging in a collage of other giant intellectual leaders. That's just how much she meant to me. So my thank you is not just to thank you from me and my family, but for all of the other colleagues from the University of Maryland who benefited from your example and your research. Yes, please, 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 yes. And recognize, which I know you do, that you just didn't touch one person because they went on and they touched other people who touched other people, who touched other people. And my colleague who's with me here, Brittany, hears about you all the time, is probably sick of hearing about you, but I know that she's better because you made me better. And we just want you to understand that. In 1967, many of you know that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave a keynote address at the American Psychological Association. And during that keynote address, he made a plea and pointed out that there are two people in the world. There are thermometers and there are thermostats. Thermometers measure, thermostats change the temperature. And he challenged psychologists as a social and behavioral scientist, I'm challenging social and behavioral science to not just measure and observe, that's the brilliance of your talk today. Yes, be able to recognize WIMPs but also do something about it, change it. We must be thermostats as well as thermometers, and you're an excellent example of them. So I wanna give you a gift on behalf of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences and the Department of Psychology, and it's a special gift. It's long overdue. It's a crystal terrapin. Yes, you can clap. She's a terp. We know she's a terp. She left us years ago, but she is still a terp. 
And I want to tell you a little story about terrapin. There is a story that goes like this. During the Roman conquest, they often used a terrapin formation when they tried to storm castles. The soldiers would put their shields above their heads and they would march in tight formation, much in the way the shell of a turtle is made up of panels and protects them from things raining down upon them. You're a terp because you have given us shields, intellectual shields that we can carry over our head so that when those wimps are throwing things at us, we're protected. And if we march in tight formation, as those soldiers did, we will storm the castle and we will win. So you're a Terp. I know you're other things, but we just want to thank you, Dr. Helms, for everything that you've been to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Lou and Dr. Nickerson for those lovely remarks. So I just want to thank all the other folks who made this day happen and this event happen. Um, really appreciate all of you for coming to this event. Um, when Dr. Neville and I were talking about wanting to do this public lecture and brainstorming different people, of course, the first person we thought was Dr. Helms and really wanting to invite her here so she could share all of her knowledge and wisdom. And of course, she did just that. So just want to briefly thank, so Dr. Liu, um, De Department Chair of Psychology, Dr. Doherty, Dean Griffin, College of Ed, Dean Susan Rivera from BSOS, so many of our doctoral students that helped. Brianna it was my doctoral student who was, we, at first it was just us on the little planning committee and then we, we gathered more and more people. So really appreciate and all of the support staff in Chessy, um, all the folks in Dr. Nickerson's office, office, Vsauce ambassadors, um, David Stanley and Radia, who are the people over doing things for us on the webinar. Just really also appreciate all of you for being here. And, um, you know, it was really a collective effort to make this possible. And of course, all of your m wonderful words of wisdom, Dr. Helms, really appreciate you. And so with that, we are wrapping up. I just encourage folks, we have a reception out, um, out in our lounge. We encourage you all to stay, have some good food, drinks, get to chat with Dr. Helms and Dr. Neville. So thank you all again.